For those of you who I have not seen uh, since before the break, Happy New Year. I am uh, extraordinarily grateful uh, for uh, all the work that you have done. Uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, Jeff uh, for his continued outstanding leadership of this Jobs Council. Uh, I think the, the plan is for me to maybe just open up with uh, a few remarks and then we've got a whole bunch of presentations, so I don't want to uh, take too much time. Is great. that all right with that's, you, Mr. That's Chairman? That's great. Um, one of the things that's been striking about this, uh, this Jobs Council is how, uh, how focused and how uh, hardworking everybody ha has been around this table. This has not been uh, a show council. This has been uh, a work council. Uh, and because of the extraordinary commitments that each and every one of you have made, uh, we have generated, uh, I think, as good a set of proposals as we have seen uh, uh, coming out of the private sector uh, to help to guide and steer uh, our economic agenda uh, and uh, our approach to jobs and growth uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, in each of the earlier meetings, we discussed uh, the key role that we all play in accelerating growth and improving America's competitiveness. Uh, and that the economic uh, recovery has to be driven by the private sector. Uh, we have moved aggressively to implement your recommendations. Uh, as I think you've heard, uh, of your 35 executive action recommendations, we've taken action on 33 of them. We've completed the implementation of 16 of them. Uh, and I'll highlight a couple of examples. Uh, building on some of the Job Council's National Investment Initiative recommendations, uh, last week, the Vice President and I hosted uh, a forum on the increasing trend of insourcing, uh, companies choosing to invest in the United States. Uh, and Intel and DuPont participated, uh, along with several dozen other companies. Uh, we discussed tangible ways that we could encourage domestic investment, and I announced a number of new initiatives and new tax proposals to provide further incentives for companies to increase investment in the United States, including expanding uh, on uh, Select USA, uh, one of the re recommendations in your last report. And we actually had uh, a company there that had benefited from uh, the services of Select USA. And it confirmed the power and capacity of uh, one stop shops and a coordinated approach uh, from the federal government uh, for somebody who's interested in investment uh, here in the United States. I've personally emphasized to the White House team and to the cabinet the importance of aggressively imp implementing the recommendations of this Job Council. Uh, I've been tracking implementation of your recommendations. Um, and we've seen substantial progress across the board. Uh, let me uh, highlight a couple other areas where your ideas and focus have had significant impact. Uh, first, on permitting. Uh, this is something that uh, I know that uh, uh, Matt and, and others really emphasized. Uh, as we all agreed, we needed to make it uh, a big investment in this country in infrastructure to assure our competitiveness. We also agree that we can't be bogged down by red tape and bureaucracy if uh, we're actually going to get uh, every bang for the buck. Uh, uh, building on administration efforts to streamline permitting, I issued an executive order to expedite review of job creating infrastructure projects and to track uh, their progress uh, on a new public dashboard. All 14 projects are on track. Most importantly, we're using these projects to learn lessons that we can scale across a whole range of projects throughout the federal government moving forward. Uh, and I want you to know that uh, as a result of your input, we're going to establish a permitting project manager effort overseen by OMB to establish performance metrics, track progress against goals, and adapt best practices uh, across agencies. So, you see, Mark can cross this off, check this <laughs> off his list. The, uh, I know he was coming here. He was going to make sure that happened. It's happening. Uh, a second example uh, on regulatory review. And we're going to have an uh, opportunity for Jeff and Cass to expand uh, on what we've been doing in this area. But I task federal agencies to cut inefficient or excessively burdensome uh, regulations and ex issued an executive order to independent agencies to look back at their regulations for inefficiencies and excessive burdens. Uh, Currently, we're estimating savings of $10 billion over 10 years by implementing just a fraction of the reforms uh, that have already been proposed and identified. 
Uh, CAS is going to provide you with a fuller update uh, in a moment, but the preliminary uh, results are exciting, and this includes, by the way, the independent agencies. So, for example, the FCC, uh, prompted by our uh, request, but also uh, uh, due to some excellent work by Julius Janikowski, uh, they've already eliminated 190 rules, 190. Uh, and that gives you some sense of the scale uh, of the work uh, that, uh, that can be done as a consequence of some of your recommendations. Um, I announced uh, last Friday uh, that I'm going to ask Congress to give me authority to reorganize the government to make it work better for the American people while eliminating duplication and waste and inefficiencies. Uh, much of this was embodied in some of the recommendations that you had in particular areas. Uh, my legislative proposal would create a consolidation authority uh, that would, for the first time, require that any reorganization proposal reduce the size of government and cut costs. So this is not just a matter of uh, moving uh, boxes around. The question is, can you actually achieve better integration, uh, better streamlining, better efficiency, and ultimately uh, better consumer service and, and, and uh, uh, better payoff for taxpayers? Uh, the first proposal we identified was to consolidate the six agencies focusing primarily on business and trade into a new department with a single mission to spur job creation and expand the U.S. economy. And this new department would consolidate the core business and trade functions of six agencies. It would be focused solely on helping entrepreneurs and businesses of all size to grow and to compete and to hire while also cutting costs and provide better customer service. So, uh, I make these points just to say that not only have you guys exceeded all expectations in providing uh, specific, uh, thoughtful recommendations, uh, hopefully we've at least met your expectations in follow through and implementation. Uh, the, 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 you know, what we haven't seen is a bunch of white papers sitting on a shelf somewhere collecting dust. Uh, we have tried to uh, take very seriously everything that you've proposed and to try to integrate it into uh, not only legislative proposals but also uh, the executive proposals out there. So uh, I read your uh, first year report. Uh, I was pleased to see that there's consistency and shared urgency about uh, America playing to win, uh, education, innovation, streamlining regulations, energy, manufacturing, all these are critical issues, and they're all interwoven and they impact each other. Uh, I recognize a lot of these issues are difficult. Uh, they've proven challenging for decades. Uh, the good news is on each of these fronts, we've made progress this year. Um, I feel confident in being able to say that uh, every one of the agencies in this government uh, has been focused on how do they improve uh, get smarter, get better, get faster, uh, become more focused on uh, delivering good value to the, uh, the end user. Uh, and uh, I believe that we've made genuine progress on all these fronts. We would not have made this progress without this Jobs Council. Uh, and I think it will pay off uh, in terms of uh, solidifying this recovery and allowing us to move forward uh, in a way where it actually translates into jobs, which has obviously been our principal and primary focus, making sure that we're creating uh, a fair shot for every American who wants to work hard and get out there uh, and, and succeed in this economy. So uh, with that, Jeff, I just want to say thank you uh, for your, uh, being able to uh, provide such outstanding leadership for this effort. And with that, I'm looking forward to hearing Great. all the good work that's thanks, already thanks, done. Thanks, Mr. President. You know, sure. I think what we said, first, uh, thanks to the Council. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the 26 of us have really been dedicated to you and to the country. And thanks to the members of the administration, uh, Jeff and Cass and others that have worked with us very diligently. I'd also like to acknowledge all our staffs who have done an excellent job as well to pull this, uh, pull this work together. I think what we said at the outset was that uh, we wanted our work to be specific, uh, nonpartisan, actionable. None of us believe that there's one silver bullet on competitiveness and job creation. This is going to take a multitude of ideas over a multitude of years to, to accomplish this. You've done a great job of summarizing, I think, the, the specific recommendations we made in October. Uh, more than 50 recommendations, two-thirds of which are being executed right now. Uh, what, we, what we wanted to do today, I think, Mr. President, is to frame some of the bigger ongoing challenges of competitiveness. Uh, that's what the roadmap to renewal does that you've got in front of you and it's going to be online. 
basically where we're focused is on the six big areas of competitiveness uh, looking into the future. Uh, uh, the key investments we have to make in education and innovation, the places where we can win in energy and manufacturing, and, and the, ultimately the new systems of what I would say competitiveness with regulatory reform and tax reform. And you'll hear a variety of that from the council members today. I think what's made the council unique is that the private sector team has been actually executing uh, uh, as we've gone forward. Uh, Paul Odellini has really designed this 10,000 engineer program. It didn't exist a year ago. Uh, Darlene Miller has put forth a tremendous program on advanced manufacturing. It's now being piloted in Minnesota and Nevada. It didn't exist a year ago. Uh, Steve Case has spearheaded the high growth entrepreneurship. It didn't exist a year ago. So the, the private sector is doing our part. And at the same time, I think the execution and OMB and, and the regulatory uh, a agencies has been excellent as well. So we feel good about the follow-up. Uh, the last thing I'd say is I think uh, on a relative basis, as, as a guy that travels the world, I, I think the U.S. is well positioned to compete and win. And, and I see that uh, going forward. So with that, the way we've kind of structured the day is to get some updates on, uh, on some areas that maybe you didn't touch from Jeff and Cass. And then we'll go to the committee and, and, uh, and have a summary of uh, some of the key initiatives. So, Jeff, let me turn it to you. Tab three, first slide, and I'm going to go very quickly because I think the, the President and you, Jeff, have already hit on many points here. The first slide, which has uh, uh, boxes running left to right, 52 discrete recommendations from the Jobs Council. And I want to second what the President said, which is many of these areas you identified uh, for the first time and we jumped on, others you helped us prioritize, but, but for your help and pushing, uh, we would not be at the point that we're at, which I think is we've gotten a lot done and we've got a busy, busy six months ahead. You start on the far left, 16 of your recommendations are fully implemented. I'll hit on a couple of highlights in a moment. 12, we have made significant progress and we're on track to illustrate, I'll use the example of the investor visas, the immigrant visas, the EB-5s. Uh, good progress across the last couple of years. It's authorized for 10,000. We're now doing 4,000, but at Mark's urging and other Jobs Council members, we've engaged a lean team over at DHS to figure out how we increase the capacity and improve the quality of the decision making at the same time. Uh, seven, our partial implementation or we're continuing to evaluate policy. Energy terrain is one of those. We did our first sale lease back. Uh, in the Gulf in quite some time. At the same time, we're working through the policy implications of some of your other recommendations. We'll continue to push hard on those seven. Seventeen are legislative. As you know, this is a difficult environment for legislation. That said, a few have already gotten done, the small business terrain, uh, SBIR authorization being an example. Uh, several will be baked into the President's budget as it comes out across the next few weeks, and we'll continue to work together uh, thinking through the legislative uh, proposals. So in total, 52 and strong progress. Let me flip to the second slide, get a few highlights, um, starting with uh, better, the Better Buildings Initiative, uh, something the Council has really put uh, muscle behind, Penny and Dick Parsons in particular. Uh, we have now commitments for $2 billion upgrade to our own federal buildings through contracts with private sector firms, so no cost to taxpayers. We're going to execute on that across the next couple of years, and $2 billion of private sector commitments. The President covered uh, the uh, promote foreign direct investment in the United States, so I'll skip over that. Boosting travel and tourism. We all know that travel and tourism is job intensive in a very good way. We've lost market share. Uh, we have made good progress on the visa front already across the last 12 months, up 35%. That's just a start. Ken and, again, uh, Penny have been helping us here, and we will be announcing new steps soon to continue to really ramp up capacity, uh, both by uh, process reengineering and through some potential policy changes. Permitting, I'll touch on in a second. Uh, the bottom line here is we will continue to move toward full implementation of the 52 uh, uh, actions, specifically the executive actions, so the 35, and at the same time we're eager for more. So I'm sure there'll be more coming out of today's session and across time. We have the capacity, we want new ideas, and we'll put our full muscle behind the implementation. The President, uh, slide three, already talked about permitting. Uh, this is the dashboard on the left-hand side, which we launched post our Pittsburgh meeting at your urging. I think you can see that for each project, the key steps are laid out 
who the owner is, what's the target completion, completion date. All 14 projects are on track for expedited review. Three are completed, and all of this is available to the public, which helps hold us accountable. Based on this work and other work coming out of the Jobs Council, I know one of the recommendations is the permitting management office approach. As the President said, we're embracing that and look forward to standing that up. So I think a lot of good progress, a busy six months ahead. Let Great. me hand it to Cass. Great, Cass. Great. Uh, thanks much. Uh, I'll emphasize uh, the three principal themes of the Jobs Council in the regulatory area over the last year. Uh, idea number one has been the need to use cost-benefit analysis to discipline the flow of new regulations. Uh, I can report that through three years of um, three fiscal years under the Bush administration, the net benefits of rules, that is economic savings, lives saved, everything you can monetize. Bush administration had $3.4 billion in net benefits. The Clinton administration had $14 billion in net benefits. We expect to be at $91.3 billion in net benefits. And that's happened in large part because of the emphasis on careful discipline from the uh, Jobs Council. Yes, Number is, 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 uh, are these figures in, in one of the, uh, is there a slide in here uh, corresponding to this or are you just doing this orally? I'm doing this orally. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, a slide on request. <laughs> um, with respect to costs in particular, which have been uh, emphasized apart from net benefits, 2007 remains the highest uh, on record, and the costs I can report are lower in fiscal year 2011 than, than in fiscal year 2010. There's actually been a reduction in costs. The bulk of co regulatory costs over the last five years have come from the previous administration, not this one, and that's been in large part because of discipline that you've helped us to achieve. Uh, your second recommendation has been to get rid of outmoded rules and to reduce cumulative burdens by emphasizing retrospective rule review of rules on the books to eliminate costs and red tape. In late August, we got 26 reform plans, one for every member of the Jobs Council, exactly the same number, uh, 26, with over 500 reform proposals and 800 pages of initiatives. Uh, a subset of these have already been finalized, not just talked about, and we anticipate uh, the elimination of millions of hours in red tape as well as billions of dollars in savings. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, for example, has eliminated 1.9 million hours in annual red tape imposed on uh, American employers. I can also say that we expect significant cost reducers in the very near future, that is in weeks, not months, supplementing uh, the, the measures that have already been announced. In a very ambitious third and final proposal, the Jobs Council has stressed the importance of applying the burden-reducing principles in the President's executive order to the independent agencies and also calling for on them to do retrospective analysis of their rules. A historic executive order from this ju past July asked the independent agencies to do exactly that, following on your recommendation. And we received just recently, a couple months ago, not five, not ten, but 16 retrospective review plans from essentially all of the rulemaking agencies that have independent status. That is, they are not within the policymaking prerogatives of the President by, uh, by congressional enactment. Not only has the Federal Communications Commission eliminated over 190 regulations, including, finally, the Fairness Doctrine and a number of other rules that impose restrictions on uh, the communication industry that have no place in modern society, but we have significant streamlining ideas from the FDIC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the Federal Reserve. We have met recently uh, with the independent agencies, and they have expressed unprecedented interest in using cost-benefit analysis to get careful analytic control of the flow of new rules. There's a lot more to do together. You've given us a ton to think about, uh, but in a very short time, we've been able to make a significant start toward a regulatory system that protects health and safety while also promoting economic growth and competitiveness. So with that, Mr. President, we'll shift gears, talk about uh, today's report. I, I think what we've tried to do previously is be specific, actionable, and try to create jobs now. 
Uh, we did 19 listening and action sessions around the country so we could hear what our fellow business colleagues and citizens had to say, and we used that to shape what we, what we picked on to, uh, to work on in terms of building these systems of competitiveness. Uh, there was a big focus on education, and that was led by, uh, by Ellen and Cheryl, and I've asked them to kind of give you a quick update on some of the recommendations we have in, in, uh, in this area. Tremendous amount of published data on education. We utilized that. We also out reached out to many different companies, associations, education officials, um, you know, public-private partnerships to really gain an understanding. And the conclusions were clear. There is building a gap between the skills we need for a competitive U.S. economy and the skills of the workforce that only appears to be growing, and all indications are it will. So we really do need to address that gap. Um, and STEM is one of the critical areas. And if you add to that the fact that many of our companies employ many scientists, engineers who are of the baby boomer generation, who are going to be retiring in the next few years, my own company in particular, will lose close to half our U.S. workforce in the next five to seven years. At least half of them are engineers and scientists, and we need to replace them. And I think it was a big topic during your insourcing forum as well. So we then looked at, there's, at the many great efforts that are going on today, and that some of them are very localized, others are broader than that, but there's a lot of activity to address this skills gap, and we wanted to really utilize what was going on and maybe identify the areas that were leverageable and that we could really uh, get some momentum with. Um, and, you know, I tell you, it was, there's just a lot of interest, a lot of uh, people were very uh, excited about helping us here. So I'm going to focus on a couple of our recommendations on K through 12, and Cheryl will take us through the, uh, the, the workforce. So the funny thing about K through 12 is that there is a unanimous that it starts before K. That there is a really a requirement for <laughs> kids come to kindergarten at the right skills, they'll be at grade level by third grade. And so there is a need to really address the preschool issues associated with this. Um, the data then suggests that it is the quality of the teacher that is the most critical component. And it's how we train them, how we develop them, and how we compensate them. You know, and these are all tools to drive systemic change. Um, we're calling for a governor-led effort to develop a roadmap for teaching excellence um, that states can use to guide their effort. There's already been a tremendous amount of work by the National Governors Association on the common core state standards. Now, this is for math and for English, but it really does develop um, just a tremendous amount of commonality around the skills that are required and at, the, and at the grade level they're required in to get our kids competitive. And we think the business community can play a big part in, in partnering um, on that effort. And then we believe you need to expand that to science. Um, that STEM is becoming critically important, and it's clear that the interest in STEM starts in the primary school, specifically middle school. And we have to find ways through that Common Core standard to, to include science and get that moving in the early, uh, early days. So now I'd like to ask uh, Cheryl to talk about our recommendations for aligning the needs of employers uh, with our education and workforce training programs. Cheryl? Yeah, thank you, Ellen, for your leadership on this. You know, we all know what's happening. We see it in our companies, which is the skills gap as we try to hire is really hurting us. And so if you look at our country and the unemployment rate, which everyone's really worried about, we still have 3.3 million job openings that we can't fill because people don't have the right skills. You know, every company I know, my own included, we're desperately trying to hire more people, but it has to be people who have the technical skills to meet the jobs we need, and it gets harder and harder to find them. So we have three recommendations. They're detailed in the report. Um, but the first is to really identify the skills at a granular level. Be very clear with it. these are the skills companies like all of ours are looking to hire. Um, the second is build training programs and the curriculum around those specific skills. And the third is to publish the database of the skills that are needed so that we can create you know, the match between the job seekers and the job demanders. You know, if you look at STEM education in this country versus other countries, it's just super clear that we're falling further and further behind. A less than a third of the U.S. bachelor degrees are in STEM, but it's more than half in China and it's more than half in Japan. And we're now in the bottom third of OECD countries. And so this goes to better K-12 through education and pre-K as we talked about, but also goes to training programs where you can take people and give them the skills they need. Um, there are also a lot of great kind of public-private partnerships. 
So I know we've worked with the Department of Labor on a small business partnership to try to use social media to match up people with job speakers. And I think Penny is going to speak next and talk about the Skills for America's Future program, just as an example of one of the things that's happening. So Mr. President, you recall we started so working with more than 250 community colleges across the nation. And we're really addressing the fact that the supply chain for skilled human capital in our country is broken. But what we've learned from this program is, is that when employers proactively engage uh, with the training providers, they ensure that the supply of job candidates is work ready. And that when community colleges offer programs based on the current demand, in the local high growth industries, the students in these programs get jobs and businesses can grow in those well organized local communities. And we've seen in your hometown of Chicago the recent announcement of uh, Colleges to Careers, which is exactly this program, which is uh, taking, building on the success of training partnerships between community colleges and local businesses. And that's really a pilot that's uh, meant to demonstrate how we can restructure our workforce system across a region. Yeah. Yeah, and just in conclusion, the opportunity is real, and it's just not what government, federal, or state need to do. I think what we've seen through it is the real power that business, in connection with states and in connection with community colleges and universities, can really move this on, um, and we're really looking forward to getting after that. Well, uh, let me just say everything that uh, uh, you guys reported on is consistent with uh, uh, where our, our focus has been. Uh, this is not going to be something that you solve in a year. This is a, a decade long, maybe two decade long project. Uh, there are some things more immediate like matching up uh, community college curriculums with businesses uh, so that folks who know they're looking for a specific s uh, skill to get a job can start getting it. That's something that we can implement more quickly. Um, the you know, producing 10,000 engineers, uh, making sure that uh, we are getting kids who are prepared going into kindergarten uh, to uh, to get the skills that they need. Uh, you know, those are some longer-term projects. I do want to just mention because um, Eric Landers here uh, with the presidential uh, is it presidential council on science and technology. I call it PCAST, but I didn't. Um, uh, Eric, uh, you may just want to make mention, uh, we made, uh, I gave them a specific assignment to dig deep about how we can improve STEM curriculum. Uh, we are starting to implement that. Uh, they've interacted with uh, Arnie's office uh, and the Department of Education. We'll be highlighting some of this, uh, hopefully, in the State of the Union. But uh, Eric, do you just want to touch on this very briefly? He guess came back to his recommendations about the, the K-12 uh, education system, then most recently with uh, what can be done at community colleges and, and universities, particularly that first two years. And there are, there are a number of things that have come out of it. Um, the closing the math gap is one of the biggest issues. I think it, it speaks to these 3.3 million jobs that are open. And then ways of teaching that engage students. There's been so much learning over the last 15 years about how to implement uh, much more effective teaching. And I think colleges and universities just need a little bit of push, a little bit of funds to be able to implement those things. And so we've come to you with sets of recommendations. I think that report will be out pretty soon, next couple of weeks. Anything to add, John? No. It will be out soon. Good. Mm -hmm. Arnie? No, I think this is all very, very consistent. Why would just push a little bit? Is this group knows so many of these policies are set at the state level. In many states, you guys emphasize early childhood education, many states have cut early childhood education. Many states dummy down standards under No Child Left Behind. Many states overemphasize testing. And we're going to do what we can to hold us accountable to provide leadership at the federal level. But the more you can drive this at the state level, I can't overemphasize how important it is. And, and the business community in these individual states where you are located, uh, you will get more attention than anything that the Department of Education through uh, uh, a paper or a, uh, a mandate we'll ever get. So uh, th th there's a lot of heavy lifting that's going to have to be done. It's, there are a lot of advantages to our decentralized system, uh, uh, but 
trying to coordinate a national agenda to upgrade our education system uh, is more difficult in a system in which uh, the, uh, you know, we do not have uh, a, a single uh, education system. Um, getting a core curriculum uh, and states to agree to it helps, but uh, it's, a, it's a patchwork effort and we're going to need to push on a variety of fronts. So. I think this is one where the business community is all in, <coughs> pretty much unanimous support to you know, a lot of the work that's going on already and some specific recommendations in the report. Uh, Mr. President, so the other piece is really investment in, in innovation and R&D, and, uh, and uh, John and Laura are just going to give us an update on some of the recommendations uh, included there. So, John, maybe send it to you on innovation. Sure. Uh, first, on a personal note, on behalf of the council, happy birthday to Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will relay it that uh, it's important. She's the birthday girl. That's right. It's family, family, family first. You know, in the State of the Union, you challenged us to out innovate, out educate, and then out build the rest of the world and you led with innovation and that's that's really central to our competitiveness and our our progress going forward and so I want to highlight two recommendations out of this report with a couple of very short stories um, entrepreneurs do more than anyone thinks possible less than anyone thinks possible and they can work in the small they can work in the large they can work in nonprofits they can work in large enterprises and, I think there's large agreement that we lost an American entrepreneur, a real icon, when Steve passed away last year. But if you look at his business accomplishments in context, five years ago there was no iPhone, no iPhone. Three years ago there was no iPad. And together today, these products that didn't exist are about $80 billion per year of business going to American companies. And that's all well and good for the Apple shareholders and their customers. What has that done for the broader economy in our country? We also created an app store. We're in a new app economy. And so they've written $3 billion worth of checks to small and independent software developers who are making services and applications running on that platform. We're in a new app economy that is based on these mobile technologies and social technologies, Facebook, Cheryl, the other end of the table, and local technologies. And that so low mo convergence coming together is is tremendously exciting. Uh, there's a company in your hometown, uh, Chicago, called Groupon, which is an example of these local technologies breathing life into Main Street America. So, as you know, they're even younger than these iPods and iPads. They're about four years old. In that short period of time, by using the cloud, they've uh, gotten over 120 million people to give them permission put in their email inboxes every day a compelling offer. It's a great right and a privilege they can't abuse, and they've grown a couple billion dollar business as a result, but here's the kicker. With those cloud, crowd, solo mode technologies, last year they drove a billion dollars of new and incremental business into Main Street USA small businesses. Thought Amazon and the internet were taking money away from those. Well, this is causing communities to get new economic life and, and, and grow jobs. My last story has again to do with this cloud and these crowd technologies and I think it's remarkable in its own right and it points the way towards one of our recommendations which is to use these technologies to target uh, innovation and education. There's a, a Bangladeshi American by the name of Saul Khan who uh, three years ago said, I'm getting out of the hedge fund business. He's MIT trained. And he decided to tutor his niece and nephew making, in math, making little 18-minute videos one at a time. Uh, they liked the fact they didn't have to deal with him one-on-one -on -one in real time. They could watch him when they wanted to. And uh, he put that up on the internet. It's grown today to where he's delivered 120 million lessons out of a curriculum of 1,800 topics largely K-12, all around the world. <clears throat> 120 million lessons from a university with a faculty of just one, a faculty of one. So this targeting of the technologies to education, using the cloud to gather a crowd, to serve a crowd, crowdsourcing, uh, making capital available for these nonprofit, for profit entrepreneurs. Uh, our, our, our group really believes is an unavoidable, it's a really obvious trend worth highlighting and moving faster. Uh, I, I think 
the uh, more we can do to bring this new app economy to all walks of American life, uh, the, the better we're going to do it out innovating, out educating, out making, and, and out growing jobs in America. Well, Mr. President, um, I, I want to um, build off of that by maybe putting the U.S. performance and some of these uh, major success stories in comparative and competitive national uh, level analysis because the competitive environment is changing, the pace of uh, innovation is accelerating, and global competition in innovation is really increasing. This is great for innovation, very, very important, uh, but we need to, as a nation and as policymakers and businesses, look at the U.S. position. And there, there's been disturbing signs that America's innovative performance has been slipping relatively compared to other countries on a number of metrics, whether you take the amount of research and development investment, its growth over time, the number of uh, engineers we're graduating, the share of STEM degrees in overall degrees, whether you take the number of patents, whether you take the creation of new firms, whether you create, take the creation of financing for, for new firms. Our number one position is no longer in many of these areas number one. It's declining relatively. The World Economic Forum now puts us at seventh in innovative capacity. So we, as a, as a council, said, all right, we recognize, as, as does your administration from the very beginning, recognize the key role of innovation in growth, wages, and competitiveness. Where are the cracks? What can we do in the foundations to make sure that we uh, stop the slipping? And so we focused on several things, uh, government support for research and development uh, investment, particularly basic science, government support for private sector research and development through the R&D tax credit, which is a very powerful and successful tool. Obviously, you've heard about STEM education, so I won't talk about that. I think Steve is going to talk about another foundation, which is basically support for entrepreneurs and financing. So let me talk a little bit about the just the R&D spending and R&D tax credit side of this. And, and I want to use two examples uh, to follow up on examples that John used. And these are very well documented in the report of uh, that's come out of your Department of uh, <coughs> Commerce uh, on, for the American Competes Act. There's a very good new website on innovation. There's a great report. It says basically all the things that we say it says uh, and it says with, with more detail. Uh, but one of the things that they have there is a couple of wonderful stories about the history of the formation of Google and Genentech. And what you see there basically is government funding from NSF government funding from NIH. They support the, the professors in the labs at the universities. They support the education of the graduate students. They come together. They come up with ideas. One is the Google idea. One is recombinant DNA. Then we get the venture capitalists to come along and take those ideas, which wouldn't have existed without that NSF support and those students and faculty, and bring them into the marketplaces. Today, we have a whole new industry, biotech. We have Google, uh, and I'm sure you could tell the same kinds of stories again and again. So we really have to be committed to uh, continuing federal support for basic science. And this is under stress, as you know. This will be under stress. It's a, it's a non-defense, non-security part of the federal budget. And uh, the council supports your goal of, of raising R&D spending in the US economy to at least 3%. An important part of that is maintaining and increasing federal spending on research and development. It also, another important part of it is getting the R&D tax credit, as you have suggested and championed all along, uh, simplified, permanent, and broader. That is, we have to compete. The rest of the world has, we, we innovated, one of our innovations was tax credits for research and development. We were the first country to offer such a tax credit. The history of the credit is that it's very effective. And uh, I put in this report for all of you to read some, a report that I worked on for, for a year, sort of looking at all the evidence on this. Economists have looked at it again and again. It works. It really works. Other countries have realized it works. So they've come along and offered even more generous research and expenditure tax credits. And companies can do their research and development around the world. And it's become more footloose. And so countries compete to get GE to move its lab there, to get uh, Caterpillar to move a lab there, Microsoft, any, any company, they will compete for it. 
Uh, so we need to make sure that we get that tax credit in place. It's been allowed to lapse, but I think we've done retroactive uh, passages of this before, and we need to work on that. Let me conclude as a segue to the next part of the conversation. America's ability to innovate, I think, even though we are slipping in some rankings relatively, I think is really second to, to none. And I think it has to do with the ecosystem of the universities, government policy, the private sector, our, 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 our venture capital industry. But what we see, I think we're worried, I'm worried about slipping on, is not our ability to innovate, but our ability to capture the value of innovation. Our innovations can go any place in the world. They can go any place in the world for tax reasons. The intellectual property can go someplace else. The production can go someplace else. The sales can go someplace else. The skills of the workforce can go someplace else. We have to worry very much about everything we can do to make the US the competitive place to take the innovation and create the value. And then I think we can talk about all the things that we need to do for that, education being one, infrastructure being one, uh, support for entrepreneurs being one. There are numerous things, but we have to make sure we are the choice of multinational companies around the world, the place to do business, the place to take the innovation and make it happen. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, look, uh, Laura, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have uh, been focused on this from the start. From the start. Um, I think uh, uh, there's not a recommendation I see in here that we haven't begun to push on. Uh, this is an area where uh, theoretically we get bipartisan support, but oftentimes things bog down in Congress. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, you know, just to give you an example, going back to PCAST, which uh, focused on this, uh, John, you may want to comment. Uh, we had uh, PCAST look at a, a, a what's happening to our R&D uh, in this country. And part of what's happening is uh, we become heavier on D. You know, it's, a, it's our big D, little r. Uh, partly because, frankly, companies are having a more difficult time. Uh, you know, Bell Labs was essentially a subsidy as a consequence of uh, a, a big uh, monopoly uh, that was able to, to subsidize some basic research. And now companies just don't have those kinds of margins where they can create that, we're, we're going to have to fill the gap. Um, and so what we're going to try to do, even in a very difficult budget environment, is to continue to increase it. Not as much as we would have liked. Uh, and this is an area where we're going to need help. Businesses are going to have to publicize why this is important. Uh, because uh, oftentimes people like this in the abstract, but when it comes time to actually trying to budget increases for NSF, uh, NIH and so forth, uh, uh, it, 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 it falls by the wayside. But and John, do you want to comment uh, at all? On well, I would just add, PCAST had a very good meeting with the President uh, the week before last talking about uh, these R&D priorities and challenges. And uh, I think we're very lucky to have a President who actually really gets, gets it, how and why these investments are crucial across the whole range of challenges our country faces, not just the economic ones, but health challenges, environmental challenges, energy challenges, security challenges, and, uh, and, and we're stepping up, notwithstanding the challenges uh, posed by the, by the budget caps with the President's leadership. But the other thing I would say that's very important <coughs> is uh, we're working very hard in concert with our partners uh, in the private sector and the academic sector on this challenge of more rapidly converting basic research discoveries into marketable products, of bridging that gap between the lab and the marketplace. And that, in turn, is, I think, going to uh, further strengthen the kind of partnerships we have across the public sector, the academic sector, and the, and the private sector in uh, translating uh, innovation uh, into, into real economic value. So the university So one of the things that's happening, if you look at the funding of R&D in the United States, that's basic, basic science. You have state and public and private universities playing a very significant role. State university research budgets are under massive attack. 
I guess a good news part of it, what led me to remember this, is that I, I know from my own state, the state of California, it does put a, a lot of pressure on the public university system to speed up the diffusion. So essentially the pressure of the budgets, which is terrible actually, and really causing some significant cuts in basic science, does uh, lead to pressure to speed up the process. And the, and the other thing I, I, I just want to say to emphasize the need to for complementarity. The, the business sector here, it's what the kind of research they do is complementary to the, the basic science. And so the, the universities can work together with the, with the business community to convince uh, our policymakers where they, where they need to be convinced that it's very important to keep up the support for basic science because it's part of the entire ecosystem of innovation. So these are the two building blocks, uh, education, innovation, uh, Next, I think, Mr. President, the one industry we all agree we've got to win in in the next decade is energy. And Lou's going to kind of highlight some of the big recommendations in the, uh, in the energy piece. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, clearly, an abundance of low-cost energy is critical to the U.S. competitiveness and job creation uh, going forward. And, and really, for many years, the United States has had a a competitive advantage in this area. Other than you know, a few spots around the world, we've enjoyed plentiful, low-cost energy, and I think that's helped to drive our economy. We have a number of challenges, though, that we're looking at today. First of all, I think everybody agrees we have over-reliance on oil, and we all know the statistics. We import roughly a billion dollars. Our import budget is about a billion dollars a day. That's likely uh, to go up as global energy demand is projected to rise 33 uh, percent by 2030, and the production of fossil fuels is unlikely to keep up with, with that. Um, U.S. investment in energy R&D and new technologies has really stayed pretty flat while other countries have upped their investments. So this ties back to what Laura and John were talking about, and especially countries like China and Germany um, are spending a lot more on, on the energy front. So as important as energy is, uh, you know, it's, the, the council thinks it's imperative that parties stop politicizing energy issues and really work on forging a new consensus on safe, affordable, and innovative solutions uh, to our energy problem. And so uh, what we've recommended in, in the report really uh, is an all-in strategy uh, that focuses on diversifying our uh, supply of uh, energy uh, I think everybody in business knows from, from a risk management standpoint, you want a diverse uh, array of uh, supply as opposed to concentrating on any one thing, particularly something like foreign oil. So we really build upon the administration's uh, blueprint for a secure energy future that came out uh, early last year. And it really focuses on three things, optimizing the use of America's natural resources while protecting public health and the environment. Uh, driving energy innovation and investment from both that basic R&D to uh, industry deployment and scaling up. I mean, it's a very capital-intensive business, so it takes uh, support even to take something from uh, the innovative laboratory side to really making it commercial. Uh, and then supporting energy efficiency measures both in electricity and transportation. If I could just take a moment and uh, talk about the one thing, um, one thing about our recommendations is that uh, even though it's a long-term balanced strategy, um, the area of energy is somewhat controversial. So I think there's something in our report for everybody to love, but there's also something in the report that everybody's going to object to. So uh, don't be surprised if there's a little controversy associated with that. But uh, one thing I think we all do agree on is that the transportation sector's reliance on foreign oil is bad for America. So we have a short-term and long-term approach to that. Short term, we really do need to tap the resources that America has, including unconventional resources. And, and that's where we actually have a, a nice benefit in all the, particularly the new technologies for uh, lateral drilling, horizontal drilling have, has created an abundance of low cost natural gas and uh, increases in oil production in the United States for the first time in, in many, many decades. Um, Long term, though, we need to support programs that promote the production and sale of other forms of transportation, not necessarily gasoline-based. So that would include, and we're not trying to pick a winner here, whether it's hybrid uh, fuels, natural gas, alternative fuel vehicles, electric, something I'm particularly partial to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we need to be investing in uh, 
the, the research supporting those technologies and uh, scaling those up. One thing the governor, government can do is to help by procuring some of these kinds of vehicles, uh, particularly for military applications, uh, and also supporting basic R&D and battery technology. That has many applications beyond transportation sector uh, that will, will help our country. And uh, as Laura and John noted, on innovation, it's a vital component for our competitiveness uh, and for meeting our long-term energy needs. And so we need policies that encourage private companies to invest in R&D and the deployment of new technologies. Uh, so again, we support uh, the making the R&D tax credit permanent, uh, support uh, production tax credits for new power generation technologies, and increasing uh, federal funding of basic research uh, and R&D in the energy area. So we think this all-in all energy strategy can create significant economic growth, significant job creation, both in terms of how it will support areas like manufacturing, uh, but also just the number of jobs in providing that energy, as you know, whether it's you know, electric cars or natural gas-fired cars, uh, wind, solar, uh, what have you. So um, you couple that with the recommendations we made in the interim report on permitting and infrastructure, uh, we think there's a lot that we can do in the energy area. Uh, assuming we can get a consensus. Well, I'm, I'm shocked that uh, there may be some controversy in this area. Uh, <laughs> it's a little disappointing, but uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I think the recommendations you've made are, are sound. Uh, we see enormous potential in uh, production of traditional uh, fossil fuels as a consequence of uh, advancements in, in e extraction. Uh, one of the things that we'll be budgeting is uh, the basic research to ensure that that's done safely in a way that protects uh, uh, the public health. Uh, and I think that's probably an area <clears throat> at this point the economics are such where we don't have to incentivize industry to, to extract it, but we do have to make sure that uh, the technologies are there to, to do it safely. Uh, where there may be some underinvestment uh, on the private side. Um, with respect to the uh, energy innovation and energy efficiency, uh, uh, th these are both areas where we see enormous potential. Uh, it shouldn't be controversial, frankly. Um, you know, I'm still scratching my head a little bit on that whole light bulb thing. Um, <laughs> not proposed by our administration, by the way, <clears throat> but I thought it was a pretty good idea. Um, and I know Jeff did too, since he <laughs> was making them. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think the, the one area is going to be around energy innovation, where uh, we're going to have to, um, and, and we've seen this obviously over the last two years, uh, this constant controversy over do, do we make investments in things like wind and solar where the unit costs don't yet match up entirely with um, uh, with, with uh, more traditional fossil fuels and, and how much does the government step in uh, in that front. Uh, now, I, you know, the, the irony is uh, that uh, part of the reason we're having this huge natural gas boom is for the last 30 years, essentially, the government's been subsidizing uh, all the R&D to develop the technologies that are allowing for the extraction of all this natural gas that we couldn't previously do. Uh, and if you add it up, uh, the amount of government subsidy over the last 30 years, it's billions of dollars. Uh, uh, nobody's remarking on that. Folks sort of act like that just kind of sprung out of thin air and is one more example of the dynamism of uh, the, the marketplace. Uh, well, the marketplace needed a nudge here. And so the question is going to be whether we, we apply that insight to uh, things like uh, uh, solar and wind and, and other renewable energies as well. Uh, that's where the controversy comes in. Um, I think having a business voice on behalf of those investments is useful uh, because uh, uh, I think uh, if it's just coming from us, then it can oftentimes look like we're trying to pick uh, winners and losers uh, or that we're we have an overriding environmental agenda as opposed to an economic uh, development agenda. Uh, and my view has always been that these things are compatible. Uh, 
uh, not contradictory. Great. And then on regulatory, we've got Matt and Mark, just an update on some of the, some of the work we've done, uh, both short-term and long-term. So Mark. Know, a quick editorial comment. There's in, in Washington, there's a lot of loose talk on a lot of different things, including on regs. And so the basic question is, what is a regulation about? What's it for? And we, we met with uh, economists, academics, business leaders, non-business leaders, a whole group of people, and came to the conclusion, you know, that this is not about minimizing the cost of regs. It's not even about maximizing the jobs associated with a given regulation. It's all about trying to achieve for the American people something that's difficult, which is what's the net benefit that you're getting and maximizing that net benefit, which is what CAS and others have been pushing, you know, for the last number of years. So for us, we came across 14 very specific recommendations, 13, you know, since you took the quarterback of the permitting thing. So we're down to 13. 13 recommendations in three, three specific buckets. One is enhancing st stakeholder engagement. A second is to, second bucket is to improve the regulatory process. I'll talk about both of those real briefly and hand it over to Matt to talk about the strengthening the regulatory impact analysis. How do we do that? Within the stakeholder uh, engagement area, we think you should establish within the agencies an independent ombudsman focused on regs because within each agency there's a clear opportunity to have the consumer, the American public, communicate to someone who's independent of the agency about what's not working within that, within that regulatory framework that that agency is responsible for. That's essentially what CAS has done and the team has done looking back at regulations, but if you have it on an ongoing basis, you provide a real opportunity for a conversation so you don't have to wait, wait, you just get it from the ombudsman on a, on a regular basis. That's the first. The second is to establish a regulatory portal by industry. This is something that's alive, you know, John can talk more about this, but if you can figure out a way to get a core set of information about what regulations apply to a given industry, it grows over time and it will improve in quality over time. So that's our second. And the third is to more consistently engage stakeholders on an early basis. There's, a, there's an inconsistent approach to stakeholder <coughs> engagement early on so that regs come out sometimes prior to the engagement having been anywhere near as thoughtful as it is in some of the agencies. It's an inconsistent practice. Within the regulatory process, just two quick comments. One would be, you've done within the Interior Department something that we think you should pilot much more aggressively, which is one-stop shop for permitting, meaning that when you Try to permit something in the United States, as Matt and others have pointed out. You're doing it at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. Within the Interior Department, you've worked now with East Coast governors to look carefully at offshore, and you've looked, worked with the state of California on utilizing federal lands for development of alternative power. Both of those efforts, if they were really driven home, you could establish a one place, what we call one-stop shop for permitting, where you're working across states. And if you went out to the states and did an RFP to say, which state's going to be the most aggressive in working with the federal government on this, I think you'd get a positive reaction. Finally, this is something that we talked to Cass about this morning, the whole team did, and therefore it's possible that uh, this is one that's already accepted. But we think that if you can figure out a way to better align U.S. regs with your major trading partners without avoiding without being a lowest common denominator factor, that can be a very powerful thing. Because many of us are operating across countries, and if we're able to do it on a consistent basis, we'd save a lot and streamline our own regulatory issues. Matt? Matt. Mr. President, we know that this is a subject you uh, you have an interest in by the amount of uh, work that your administration, the agencies are doing. I, I do believe there's been a lot of progress. Uh, a couple of the things that we continue to come back to. One is the cumulative impact of regulations. And we've had uh, several times to have conversations with CAS and other people of your administration as late as 9 o'clock this morning. And uh, I think it's something that he has an interest in and exploring. And, and that's what we're really trying to do is to find that right balance of protecting health and safety, but also creating an environment of, of where companies want to come and provide more capital uh, formation and, and ultimately then, of course, hire people and create jobs. Uh, the whole issue of retroactive review of what you've taken up with the independent agencies is vitally important. Uh, we believe in that very much. Uh, one area that we do believe in more government would be to expand ORIRA. 
Uh, we'd like to see uh, more, uh, more people for, for Cass and, and his team. Um, and we just know that this country you run has a lot of, of agencies, a lot of different talents, a lot of different quality of the analysis that's done in this cost benefit analysis. And, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of on the edge on this with versus the um, many others on the commission. But I, I really hope you'd keep your eye, uh, mind open to codification of these issues because I think one of, the, one of the issues that business faces is that as administrations come and go, uh, the rules get changed. And, um, you know, you pull back the ozone rule. Well, does that mean that the next administration is going to Im impact it? And, and, and providing a process that has more uh, clarification by statute uh, will improve the professional analysis of the cost benefit analysis. And, and quite frankly, I think it would go a long ways to shutting the business community up and creating well, an I, environment. You know, let's, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take that as a yes, so I appreciate hearing that. The, the rest of your team wasn't so quite so, uh, quite so anxious on that one. But, uh, we appreciate the, uh, the work you've done so far on this. Well, I, I, as I said, and I, I think uh, uh, Cass uh, will testify to this, both literally and figuratively. Um, we, we, we take this extraordinarily seriously. Um, and, and I think we, we, uh, there are some good lessons learned. We're in the process of pushing them down into the agency levels, both uh, our agencies and the independent agencies. Uh, we've seen more responsiveness, the, uh, less pushback, uh, I think, on a lot of this stuff than we might have expected. Um, uh, I, I think some of the process recommendations that you made, Mark, are, are sound. Uh, I, I do think that one of our experiences, at least one of my experiences over the last three years, is that uh, the agencies oftentimes feel more defensive and the stakeholders are less constructive if uh, uh, stuff happens late as opposed to stuff happens early. If the consultation happens late, if the rule's already out or has already been proposed, uh, then it's, it's harder to get all sides to sit down and try to figure out uh, how, how do we solve this problem uh, as opposed to how do we beat back the other guy's efforts. And, uh, and so I think that we should look very carefully at, at many of the process recommendations uh, that you, uh, you made. Um, I, uh, you, you, know, you mentioned uh, the, the Interior Department and what they're doing in terms of one stop. Uh, that, that one of the values of this whole process has been seeing uh, each agency try different things and then us trying to collate what are the best practices, what are the lessons learned, and then seeing if we can uh, spread that across the agencies. In, in terms of the codification issue, uh, look, the, uh, uh, we've, we've got to just give that more thought. You know, the, the challenge here is how do you, uh, I'll, I'll be very blunt, uh, given the complexities of the, the issues involved by, with all these agencies, uh, if you've got a whole set of these rules that are subject to even more congressional uh, uh, how, how will I phrase this charitably? If Congress is more deeply involved in the details of each and every one of these regulations, then I think what you get is gridlock uh, of the sort administratively that we've already seen legislatively. And that's uh, a source of concern. Um, I do appreciate, though, the need for consistency uh, across administrations. Uh, some of that, frankly, uh, uh, I, I think can be achieved if OIRA, part, some of the stuff that we're doing is institutionalized within OIRA, uh, uh, which under CAS I think has become much more prominent and has been uh, doing much more uh, work. La last point I'd make uh, just with respect to uh, the, the point you uh, made, Mark, uh, about uh, our trading partners. Uh, Ron, you may want to comment on this, but uh, in, in something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, our, our next major trade initiative, uh, the idea of regulatory um, uh, synchronization uh, is something that uh, is, is very important to us. And, and I think in, in all of the discussions we're having, both across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, uh, this is a topic that's come up. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Ron? 
you've said it well, and Mark, I'll give you my information, but we are the, the, the most um, ambitious effort we have at regulatory cooperation is through this new Trans-Pacific Partnership. But to the President's credit, one of the real um, focuses of our hosting the APEC Forum this year with the 21 members was looking at regulatory convergence. And the President has asked us to do this in all of our configurations. So we have a similar effort going on with Mexico and Canada. We're doing similar things with a new effort we just launched with the European Union. But if you can imagine the difficulties of addressing what Matt said just within our bureaucracy, you can imagine the challenges with countries. One practical thing we're doing, though, is say at least going forward, let's have much more engagement because it's so hard to go back and look at different cultural regulatory systems looking backwards. But that is a critical element, and we're doing it in Asia, we're doing it in Europe, we're doing, doing it here in North America. And I'll be happy to provide uh, the council more information on that. So, Mr. President, that's really. I think, I think we got. The, oh, sorry, yeah, thing, sorry, Jeff. Thank you. Um, one other point that came up in our meeting this morning is where CAS started with eighty billion dollars worth of savings, more than prior administrations. There was some take back by a pause for everybody that that's a huge win and not perhaps understood by everybody because the economy's been slow. There's been a perception that uh, more regulations. And so I think there's a communications opportunity. There may not be total agreement on exactly the road ahead every time because there are different tensions, but um, there's a lot of great work that's been done. I don't think collectively we've gotten that message no. across. Uh, Brian, that's music to my ears. Uh, <laughs> I would love for us to all work together uh, to tell this story. I, and, I, and I just want to emphasize this. The, uh, there are going to be some regulations we put out there that the industry is impacted uh, are going to balk at. And they, it is entirely legitimate. You know, that's part of our political process. We put out a rule, they come back and they say this is stupid, this is unnecessary, et cetera, and there are going to be some conflicts. Um, but the gap between practice and perception on this is probably greater than in any other area uh, of our administration, at least as it affects business. And um, closing that gap so that people have a more honest assessment exactly of what we've done when it comes to regulation, uh, and that businesses have some confidence that we're not out there trying to uh, uh, crush their, uh, their entrepreneurial spirit uh, or the profit motive uh, uh, with uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, that that uh, would be very useful mainly because uh, uh, it, it would also, uh, I think, give uh, businesses confidence that if they've got a real legitimate gripe, you know what, it turns out that you can actually get it worked through and, and uh, uh, the federal government is responsive. So uh, I'd, lo I'd love some recommendations and some suggestions on uh, how we get that message out there. Let's do two quick private sector updates. Paul, maybe the engineering initiative just up there where we are. Okay, Jeff, thank you. Mr. President, we talked about this at the, in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, we are well on our way to implementation of this program. Um, as you may recall, the issue is we, uh, our engineering graduates have been stagnant for several decades at 120,000. Uh, our goal is to essentially double that over the next decade, and it got short, uh, shorthanded into 10,000 more over the next couple of years. There's three prongs to the program. Uh, the first is to get uh, the best known methods of um, the best colleges of engineering in the country implemented across uh, a broad, broader uh, 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 sector of the universities. The deans are meeting here in Washington at the White House on February 6th to kick off this gold seal of excellence in, in uh, engineering programs uh, uh, around a certain improved curriculum that <coughs> drives uh, uh, down attrition and, and up graduation rates. Um, the second part of the progr program, we have the top 25 schools involved, They'll be at the top 200 by the end of February, and we're looking at the top 2,000 over the next year or two. It, of course, needs some money. Um, the private sectors kick in 50 million. We have a contribution from several firms in this room now um, that will direct funding towards uh, not just mentoring programs for the students, but also training the teachers on the best known practices. Uh, we think we can close the gap on the funding we need through NSF redirection of existing funds. I have a line of sight, so there's no ask for you on that one. Uh, the second part of the program has to do with um, um, 
jobs for the for the kids because if they don't touch engineering before they graduate, the odds on them being interested are very low. We've, we've now have 67 companies committing to 7,500 jobs this summer, investing $70 million of their own money into jobs, and I would expect that would grow over time uh, on an annual basis. The third part deals with uh, getting kids to be more interested, to stay with engineering, to come into engineering. And we have an event at Georgia Tech in March uh, where um, it's sort of a national pep rally, the National Day of Engineering. That's going to happen across the country. It's going to be broadcast live on MTV. We've got commitments from Facebook and, and uh, Comcast as of this morning. Thank you, Brian and Cheryl, to also uh, Good work. Uh, help us there. Um, the, there's an MTV program called um, Stand-In Professor, uh, where they have celebrities come in and, and, and surprise and teach classes around the country. Um, a number of us have signed up to do that. MTV wants, wanted me to extend an invitation to you, should you want to go back into the as classroom. As long as I don't now. have to teach engineering. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'd uh, be we, happy to do we it. We can make this happen. Uh, so so in, in short, we're, we're in ex deep execution mode. I would expect to see uh, the results uh, of engineering graduates improve linear, linearly over the next 10 years. Great, great initiative on that one, Paul. Thanks. Steve, high growth. Good news for this front, though. When we met in October, uh, we talked about the importance of high growth uh, enterprises and backing entrepreneurs and the history of building America through, through the back of, of uh, these entrepreneurial companies and a lot of job creation. Uh, and we laid out three priorities uh, at the time, and I, you gave a great speech in Pittsburgh talking about the story of entrepreneurship as really being the story of, of, of America. One was what the administration needed to do and with the uh, work of, of uh, Jeff and others. Well, there's a lot of progress on patents and small business. I'm we're delighted the Small Business Administration is now at a cabinet level and so the, the effort to reorganize around sort of a new department of business we also think makes sense. In the last 90 days, administration has done a lot. The private sector has done a lot as well, as you know, because you were kind enough to host the board of the the Startup America Partnership uh, a few weeks ago here. Uh, 50 companies now have committed over a billion dollars of resources to help the next generation of, of entrepreneurs, and we're building up these startup regions around the, the nation. So administration's done its part, and the private sector's done its part. The real question I think we all had 90 days ago was Congress going to do its part? And I'm actually quite encouraged in the last uh, 90 days, almost a dozen different bills have been introduced by the Senate and the House with bipartisan support in, in most cases. Uh, one last month, for example, I know you talked to Senator Warner recently about the Startup Act that he introduced with uh, Senator Moran a few weeks before. There was an Agree Act from Senator Coons and Senator Rubio that are really focusing on the issues we identified around access to capital, around the issue of talent, high-skilled uh, workers, around regulation, particularly around crowdfunding and, and Sarbanes-Oxley. And people really have made this a priority in the last 90 days. So I'm really quite encouraged with, with your Leadership, hopefully, will be a focus of the State of the Union and been working with Gene and Valerie and others in the last uh, few weeks. They've been really generous with their time trying to craft the right legislative solution. There is a moment here where I do think, even though everybody knows how difficult things are right now in terms of uh, getting legislation passed in what is a difficult uh, environment, there is a moment where people do recognize the important role entrepreneurs play, how they are the big job creators, how they are the big drivers of economic growth, and how it's really critical that we double down on our nation's entrepreneurs as other countries. Countries, as, as John and Laura and others have articulated, are stepping up their game and trying to replicate America's secret sauce around entrepreneurship. So the next couple of months are critical. I think there is a, an opportunity, clearly as interest in Congress, there is bipartisan support, and we'll work with your, with your team to try to make sure we get this done in, in the next couple of months. Good. So we've got a lot of this, Mr. President, going on, I think, that as the Council has framed it. Uh, lastly, let's hope Roger doesn't ruin the day on the economy. So. <laughs> Just I always get that challenge. Um, first, I'd like to make a, uh, <clears throat> an unscripted ad hoc comment about what you said about regulator. I think as the only former regulator in the room, I would endorse your prudence about changing the regulatory process from being administrative to having to be more judicial and, and legislative, having been the um, 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 participant in a fair amount of interaction with Congress as a regulator. I think Congress has plenty of ways to influence regulators, and it's, your prudence, I think, is well-founded. Um, let me now turn to the thing I was asked to do, which is to talk about the economy. Um, I did have a chance to consult with a few others, and I will not surprise you by saying the economy globally is a tale of three stories, basically. Uh, the U.S., I would say, still a mixed story, but there are actually some little signs of improvement here and there. Uh, consumer confidence has, has gone up. Business confidence seems to be improving as well. Um, the most recent data suggests that possibly this year will be a year where we're going to be growing at potential. 
not superb, not enough to really dent uh, the thing that you and I and all of us care about, which is the unemployment rate, dramatically, but I think probably better than we have been in the past. Uh, Europe, as you well know, um, perhaps a different story, mixed down if the U.S. is sort of mixed to up. Uh, the debt crisis there is weighing very heavily uh, markets. I'll come back and talk about that. Uh, and the policymakers and politicians, there, I think, are having a little trouble figuring out how to deal with all of that uncertainty. Uh, my friends at the European Central Bank, I think, have uh, gotten some religion about being more aggressive. The acts they've taken in the last uh, few weeks, I think, have had the desired impact. Uh, so Europe, I would say, bears a lot of close watching. I'll come back and tack, uh, tackle about that a little bit more. The third big engine, obviously, is the emerging market. Uh, and there, things continue to look strong. As I've talked to some folks around this table, I think they're still picking up some strength in the emerging markets. Uh, China has reported its growth rate coming in uh, yet again at around 9%. Um, and that's quite important to us because not just China, but Europe in general, I'm sorry, emerging markets in general are uh, an important uh, uh, taker of our exports. And so I think this is really quite important. As I go from what's happening in the economy to a place that I spend all of my time, uh, which is looking at markets, again, two or three different stories. Um, equity markets last year were highly volatile, as you know, relatively flat. They've started off this year with lower volatility, uh, a little bit of an uptick uh, in equity markets. Too early to say that it's going to be you know, a superb year, but it's nice for those who focus on investments to see volatility come off. Um, the challenge in equity markets is that volume is a little low, so it's too early to say, ah, great year, but we start off in a better place, and some of the things that were problematic last year seem not to be as problematic right now. Fixed income markets on the other side are global. Uh, they continue to suffer with uncertainty about the U.S. economy, but now obviously it's great uncertainty about the European economy uh, as well. And so there's some concerns in fixed income markets. Um, I think one of the questions that might be on your mind or other minds is, okay, interesting story, what can we do about it now? Uh, two or three things I think are important. One is to avoid what I would describe as self-inflicted wounds in the policy space. You know, Jack Lew, uh, Alan Kruger here, uh, Gene Sperling, you're surrounded by folks who can help you figure out uh, how to do that. Um, but I think it's really quite important that the administration continue to push down both smart economic policy, but also a point that uh, Brian was making, others were making, communication about what's been done to try to not tell a story, but rather to get the story out is quite important. Um, finally, um, Secretary Bryson is here, uh, Secretary Geithner, I guess, will join us later. Continuing to interact with Europe and helping them get their story uh, is not the easiest thing to do, having been in that place a little bit myself. Uh, but it is quite important for the U.S., I think, to continue to work with our European colleagues and friends um, because of the interaction on markets. Uh, in the private sector, one of the things I've noticed, and Alan can verify this, um, um, productivity has been growing quite rapidly during much of this turnaround, which is not surprising. Um, I think it's starting to come off a little bit, um, which uh, is not something one normally celebrates. But what that does imply is if there's any uptick in aggregate demand in the U.S., we may start to really hit in on this jobless number. And Alan's shaking his head, so um, I, he wasn't one of my professors, but we still <laughs> look like we agree on this point. Um, and so I would encourage your team to continue to watch what's happening in the private sector around this productivity story. Um, and finally, uh, Cheryl's a very important point. There are a large number of job openings out there. So the issue around getting uh, the jobless and the jobs aligned is quite important. And then the final point I'd make um, closes up and I think reinforces what you've heard here is I think about the long-term issues, uh, all about education, education, mm -hmm. education. Doing what I would do, um, I would add an, an angle that many here won't add, which is financial education. Um, I don't think I can go on MTV and get them to uh, post a big story in economics, so Alan would be a great uh, person to do that. Um, but I do think we need to figure out how to handle the financial literacy side of this as well as doing all the other kinds of education. So the headline is um, things do seem to be getting incrementally better, um, but I wouldn't describe it as necessarily, uh, necessarily going to be dramatically robust, but I think definitely positive over where we were last year. So Mr. President, that's, uh, that's an update. I think we've tried to be specific, actionable, aspirational, uh, you know, uh, and all of our reports from short to long term, maybe 75 or 80 specific recommendations, uh, putting those into implementation mode. And I think all of us are, uh, all of us uh, have really been uh, committed to the process, uh, committed to build confidence and outreach. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work ahead, but I think uh, all of us are, are optimistic about the future of the country. And 
are glad uh, and, and hoping that we can continue to push these ideas and recommendations forward. Well, I, I just, again, want to thank all of you for uh, uh, the seriousness uh, and uh, effort that you've put into uh, uh, this Jobs Council. Uh, we're going to continue to gather recommendations from you uh, and are going to continue to try to implement them as quickly as we can. Uh, those where uh, we think there's an issue, we'll get back to you and there will be an iterative process where we'll be uh, in discussions in terms of how we can achieve some of the goals that have been uh, set. Um, uh, I, I want you to know that uh, obviously uh, uh, you know, this year is, is an election year and so getting Congress focused on some of these issues may be difficult. Um, but we have been struck by the, the degree of uh, capacity we have administratively to at least chip away at some of these problems. Uh, oftentimes it's hard to get the kind of comprehensive solutions that you want without legislative involvement. Uh, but uh, those small incremental steps, uh, they add up uh, and uh, we're going to continue to to, to make sure that we push that as hard as possible. I, I did notice that uh, you know, we didn't have time to talk about manufacturing, uh, although, Jeff, I know that uh, you and, 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 and Rich Trumka and others had, had spent a good deal of time on it. Um, in, in some ways, that's all right, because essentially that whole insourcing conversation was really a manufacturing conversation. Uh, and uh, I was in incredibly impressed with the potential, at least, for us to start getting manufacturing back in the United States in selective industries, understanding that if you've got, uh, you know, if, if you've got products that involve you know, high volume, lots of labor, unskilled labor, that it's going to be difficult to move those back. On the other hand, where you have uh, uh, skilled labor, uh, our competitive advantages are, are, uh, are accelerating. And uh, we're going to really be pushing hard on that front along with issues like you know, uh, basic research, et cetera. Partly because my understanding, and John and others, I think you guys helped Steve Jobs and others helped educate me uh, on the fact that uh, if all our manufacturing facilities move offshore, then it's actually hard over time to keep our uh, R&D uh, uh, here because so much of this ends up being a matter of seeing how something works in an applied fashion and tinkering with it and going back at it. Uh, We've set a goal here, Mr. President, to try to get back four points of global market share and value added in manufacturing. We think we can do that. People like Paul and I that travel the world, I think we see the U.S. more competitive today than we have in the last 20 or 25 years. So that's, uh, I think that's a, 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 another great initiative here. It's, it's a good news story. It, it, string, uh, it, it uh, merges. Uh, uh, directly with our export initiative and uh, the great work that uh, people like uh, you know, Fred and uh, Ron and others are doing. So uh, we're going to keep on pushing that. You'll see that as a significant focus in our uh, State of the Union as well. So thank you, everybody. Great work. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. President.